Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain. My name is Carly, and I'm going to be the moderator for today. If you're watching with us live, welcome, and we encourage you to participate by using the chat room feature. It's either going to be below our video or right next to it, depending on how you're viewing. If you're watching with us after hours, we encourage you to send any feedback you have by emailing us at info at majestictheater.com. And lastly, if programming like this is something that you value, we encourage you to make a donation over at MajesticTheater.com. And without further ado, I would love to introduce Danny and Robbie. Hey there, everybody. Welcome. Hi. welcome. Hello. hello. <laughs> uh, welcome to our new day and time for Behind the Curtain at the Majestic. Um, you know, we thought with, uh, with the weather breaking and uh, people really needing to get outside, especially these in this pandemic era, I guess, uh, that Tuesdays at two o'clock, or, or rather Sundays at two o'clock was not an ideal time. So we're shifted to Thursday at seven o'clock. So uh, a couple other quick notes. Um, children's theater. We have uh, the Cat in the Hat running right now, our production of the Cat in the Hat. And on Sunday, we'll have a behind the curtain with the children's theater. My guest next week, Rand Forster, who's a uh, Yale School of Drama graduate, director, um, been directing plays with us since our very second season, I think. So excited to have Rand in. And occasionally we see him on stage for something, but that'll be a lot of fun. And then the week after that, uh, Ray Gilmet, our very own um, Elvis tribute artist. And you know, he does our holiday show, and he was actually in a play one time many years ago. I don't know if he'll want to talk about it. He probably will. But So that's what's coming up. Uh, say hello to our very own Robbie Simpson, West Side born and bred. We've got some great photographs <laughs> to show you. Of, I'm worried. Of young Robbie Simpson. Um, you know, I've said this to him a hundred times, but, you know, one of my uh, – favorite memories from the Majestic is uh, when Robbie was probably 10 years old. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, he and his mom were uh, subscribers to the Majestic and they sat in the front row uh, and they were subscribers at the Majestic for, for years until we decided to pull Robbie up on stage and make him part of the action. Yeah. All right, Robbie, first question for you. What was your favorite show to be in at the Majestic? Uh, I think that's a two-part answer for me because probably the most fun I've had doing a show at the Majestic was doing Miss Saigon. Uh, I think that was, um, I was in high school at the time, but just being with all those uh, a lot of actors from the community, but also a lot of actors from New York who did the show on tour or on Broadway. So it was a really cool mix of new people and old friends. And we just had uh, a little bit too much fun doing that show. And of course, you know, that's one of the most incredible musicals of all time. So that was, that yeah, was really cool. I think you were probably, you were set maybe 17 at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, uh, you know, which which really kind of follows history because so many of of the the soldiers who went over to Vietnam were seventeen and eighteen years old. You know. Oh so, yeah, my dad went over to Vietnam when he yeah. went to high school, so just after that age. So you know, there was a you know a, a majority of us that were that were that age, and I think you you know you did that on purpose because you wanted people to actually be age appropriate. I think that tells the story really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then the funnest show to do, you know, as an actor, like working on something was probably the last five years, which is a show I did um, about five years ago with Darcy. It was a two person musical and uh, it was just the two of us on stage. And that was probably the most, um, challenging and, and, and fun to work on just because there's such an arc. And when there's only two people in a show, you know, you got, you have a lot to do. It's a lot of heavy lifting, but, but really fun and kind of a dream role for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting um, about the last five years. Um, <coughs> that show got 
recommended to me, I don't know, time and time again. And, and um, part of the recommendation was, oh, you know, you're really going to attract a younger audience mm -hmm. um, with that show. And I don't think we did. You know, we have our basic core audience. Yeah. And, and I think in, in hindsight, um, many of them had difficult difficulty uh, uh, tracking that show. Yeah. Um, you know? My character starts, there's a picture right there of, of yeah. me and the amazing Darcy. My character starts the show and tells the story in a, in a linear order from beginning to end. And Darcy's character actually starts the show at the end of our story. So it, spoiler alert, at the end of the breakup or the end of the relationship. And then she tells the story backwards. And so the only time we're together on stage was to sing uh, the next 10 minutes, um, which was just a, a, an incredible song. And, um, and actually a few theater companies are doing the last five years because it's one of the only musicals you can do socially distanced. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, hey, yeah, yeah. you're probably going to have a comeback. Yeah. Um, what What are your? Uh, have you got some favorite majestic actors um, that you've worked with or you've watched on on our stage? Yeah, for me, being in high school and working with these professional actors, you know, some from the community and then others from New York or Boston, I was always in awe of. So many of the people that I was acting with and saw on stage and have watched so long growing up. So I could give you a huge list, but but some of the actors for me that jump out, um, I did you know over the tavern was was one of my first shows at the at the Majestic and Janine Haas played my mom and she was always just such a professional, so um, funny off stage, but was. Um, you know, a really incredible actor. And I just remember learning a lot from her and really generous, you know, with the younger members of the company. Um, and then I have to give a shout out to former behind the curtain guest, Kate Damon. Um, mm. I had never done a show with Kate before, but she was always a regular at the Majestic that I would watch in so many different shows. And then uh, her and I have never worked at the Majestic together, but we got to do Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf over in Holyoke last summer. And, and we had a blast and it was, very cool actually getting to work with her. I just think she can, you know, she does so many different things and, and it's always fun to see what she's doing next. So, uh, but I could give you a list of people. Sandra Blaney is another one. So. Yeah. Yeah. From, uh, oh, what was that play? <laughs> the, the Sandra wow. and, and, and uh, Lost in Yonkers. I did Lost in Yonkers with her, but. Um, you but, and Steve yeah. Fettick were the, were the kids. Yep, yep, that was my second show at the Majestic. Uh, and fun fact, it was my second show, but it was the first show that I did all the performances for. Because the first show that I did at the Majestic was a Christmas story based on the, uh, the movie, you know, You'll Shoot Your yeah. Eye and the Leg Lamp. And there was a cast of six kids in the show, but Danny double cast the kids and we would do alternate performances. So, you know, we were only out, you know, three or four nights a week uh, rather than the whole week. But the very next year, Lost in Yonkers was just two, you know, two high school aged boys. And Steve Pettit and I did that. And I felt so professional getting to do all the performances, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every night and then waking up and going to school in the morning. So it was fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, get a, did you have um, classmates at, at school? Were they aware of, of your involvement? In, oh, in yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, and it was it was a big, it. yeah. It's a big, it's a huge commitment. You know, doing <coughs> show is at the majestic is it's a job, and and when you're doing it as a kid who's doing it in school, you know, that's when you know it was really that show where you know, priorities started to come into focus in my mind and what was important to me, at least at that age. <laughs> that's, a, that's a picture of the very first company of the Majestic Children's Theater, which I was very proud to be in the very first company, gosh, probably in like 2005, uh, directed by Van Ferrier. Um, but, but, you know, because when I did Lost in Yonkers, I had to quit playing soccer for West Springfield High School. 
I had to, uh, well, I wasn't able to do all the commitments required. Uh, I was in band, in the marching band in, in high school, and I wasn't able to make all of those commitments. So I had to do a lot of work outside of school. And, and I really made the decision, I'm going to focus on acting and I want to do it. You know, it was a job. You were paying me. So I, I was doing it professionally and to the best of my ability and, and gave up things to do that, you know, whether it was soccer or hanging out with friends or, um, you know, getting schoolwork done at, you know, 11 PM, you know, after the show, sure, yeah, yeah. but it was all worth it. It was an education in itself. Yeah. It's interesting. There are, you know, a lot of people over the years have uh, to me expressed an interest in getting involved in the theater. You know, the notion of, of being in the theater uh, is, is really exciting. The idea of it, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, but as is often the case, you know, folks who kind of get involved for a short while and figure out it's uh, like a hell of a lot of work. And yep. they didn't anticipate that. And, you know, they fall by the wayside, you know. So and listen, they, they end up being audience members, which, you know. <laughs> Can't have the value of the audience. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. And I've gone forward and made a career out of doing it. And they always say, you know, if you can do something else, if you want to do something else, then do it because it's, it's hard. The, the craft is hard. The pursuit of, you know, pursuing your art is hard. The career is difficult. So um, I think those that end up like really going for it, it's because, you know, you get bit by the bug, as we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should talk about for the audience, Robbie, um, just just kind of your progression from you know sitting in in uh, the front row with your mom watching shows um, to the children's theater to the main stage and you know other kinds of things and 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 what happened from uh, from there. Where where did you go to college and all that kind of stuff? So uh, yeah, for sure. Fill us in on that. So. I auditioned for my first show, The Majestic, A Christmas Story, and I was in eighth grade. And there was a lot of kids in that. It was really cool to be selected. The, it was a big deal to get in, to be cast in Lost in Yonkers the next year. And then from there, Danny was, uh, you know, you've been a mentor for me. And uh, ca you cast me in at least one or two shows every year throughout all of high school. And uh was really exciting. And that's, that's really how I started meeting other actors from New York. You know, I can think of a few that I was like, you know, we're doing Lost New Yorkers with David Volan, who's another uh, majestic, yeah. uh, fantastic majestic actor who, who uh, works in New York and works all over the country. And I would see people like that. And I'd say, well, you know, you don't have to be a celebrity to make a living at this and to really make a go of it. You can, act in some shows, you do some commercials, you do some television work, you teach, uh, maybe you coach on the side, you know, there are many ways to make a living. And so it was really through seeing those people that I, that I made the decision to, um, to go and pursue it as a degree for college. I remember exactly the moment and it was at the Majestic where I decided, yes, I want to go get my BFA or Bachelor of Fine Arts in acting. And it was when we did Over the Tavern, it was about four kids uh, in a Catholic family. And it was- In really, Buffalo. In Buffalo. <laughs> Forget um, Buffalo. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and then you did the sequel to it, which I'm forgetting the name, but it's with the same family 10 years later. And right. of course we weren't in it because we were you know, 10 years too young for the parts. But you did a talk back with the four actors that were doing our parts. And then the four of us came and we talked about, you know, what it was like seeing other people play the same character, but 10 years older. And I just was so enraptured by how cool that was and how the audience was so taken by it that I, uh, that I was like, oh, this is just what I have to do. So I then um, did Miss Saigon. The last show I did before I went to college was Inherit the Wind, which was a great show with another behind the curtain member, JT Waite. Yeah. And, uh, and I went to Syracuse for four years. During the summers, I would go to um, the New England Theater Conference, which is just outside Boston. And you go and you audition for 
a whole slew of summer theaters all at the same time. You know, you audition and then maybe you get like 10 callbacks and you go to different hotel rooms and audition for these theaters. And so I'd work in places in Rhode Island for the summer. I spent two summers up in New Hampshire at the Paper Mill Theater. And then I graduated from Syracuse and I moved to New York and I was there for uh, in and out of the city for about nine months to a year. I did a show at Berkshire Theater Festival just up the road from, from the Majestic. And then I went to grad school for my MFA, Master of Fine Arts in Acting at the University of San Diego, uh, <laughs> which was the most beautiful place to possibly uh, go to school. And you know, my decision to do that and to do it so soon after undergrad was, you know, I had a teacher that's a casting director that said to me, when I was in New York and auditioning and I had an agent right out of school, but he said, you know, look at the people who are doing what you want to be doing. Who are the people that are playing those parts on Broadway or in television or at those regional theaters? And what is in their resume that you don't have? And a lot of these actors that I admired or that were doing, you know, what I wanted to do had MFAs from Yale or NYU or the Old Globe in San Diego, which is where I ended up going. So the best part was my grad program was an all expense paid. They even paid us to go there. Mm. Seven people in San Diego working at the Old Globe with, you know, my first show I was working opposite Robert Sean Leonard, Tony Winner. People know him from um, that TV show with all the doctors. Uh, and, and it was a cool experience and I loved it. And then I graduated, I came back to New York I got uh, the agents, I signed with the agents I really wanted to be with. So it was a really easy decision to come back to New York. But my first show after graduating from the Old Globe, you know, this fancy acting program with, we did a lot of Shakespeare and Shaw. And the first show I did was the last five years was, was a musical. Um, but it was really cool to take all that acting training, you know, working on all this other stuff it's almost like for dance, doing ballet, you know, strengthening those muscles and then coming back to the Majestic. And, you know, I was so happy to have that job and come back home and, and do the last five years with, with Darcy. And it was just such a blast. And then from there, I've been living in New York, working, um, you know, kind of around the country at a lot of different places. I came back and did another show. The Majestic, which you directed called Breaking Up is Hard to Do, which if you ask any member of my family, that was the best show I've ever been in because it was, uh, <laughs> you know, all that fun, Carol King, you know, music, just just really funny kind of zany show. Uh, but it was it was really fun. And I got to do that with, you know, my best friend. Shout out to Alexandra. So that was really fun. Neil Sadaka. Neil Sadaka. Yes. All Neil the Neil Sadaka Sadaka music. Yeah. Which is even more more upbeat than than uh, than Carol King. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and then, which was really exciting, you know, over the past few years, I, you know, you do a show somewhere, and um, not going to mention, you know, where it wasn't the majestic, but you don't get. Um, there we go. That's breaking up is hard to do. That was yeah. uh, the last show I acted in. Um, really fun. My character's name was Del Delmonico, so that kind of tells you all you need to all you need to know about him. <laughs> Says a lot. That was uh, that was during Calendar Girls, where those two girls had to change. Don, the costume designer, amazingly had them changing costumes. You know, like in fifteen second costume changes for each month of the song into bathing suits and like evening dresses. That was that was a really fun fun song. Um, and, you know, and so I, I, I've been doing these shows and, you know, sometimes you don't get a great director <laughs> and, and as an actor, you know, when you, or I don't want to say that you don't get a great director, but you get a director that kind of lets you do whatever you want to do and let you come up with it. And so you really have to be thinking on your feet and thinking about the story that you're telling and working with the other actors. And I did that a few times and was realizing that my brain was going more and I was working more like a director and thinking more like a director. So I started assisting on some productions. I was um, the assistant on the national tour of Chicago with the original Tony winning director, Walter Bobby. And then I started working on the national tour of a Christmas story, the musical. And then Danny gave me a, a great opportunity to um, direct death trap at, the Majestic Theater last season, 
which uh, I had just done at the Cape Playhouse in Dennis, Massachusetts. I had I'd been in it. I played Clifford in Death Trap. And so it was really fun to come back and jump on the other side of things and direct it or a portion of it and do all that fight stuff. Uh, all, all that fight stuff is really fun for me. When I was in, in grad school, we did a lot of that. It was really fun to you know do all that stuff with the fake blood. And uh, yeah, that's the production of Death Trap at the Majestic uh, with Jack and Ron, two incredible, incredible actors that you know made it our job, Danny, because Danny and I kind of tag team that show. Well, we, should, we should let people in on, on this a little bit, I think, right? So we were, uh, I think we had just wrapped our first week of rehearsal, <laughs> I think. Yep. And and um, Robbie, I, I got a phone call from you, and this is like, can we talk about something? <laughs> I know, and you're probably like, oh, no, what's happened? What's yeah, going on? What's going on, yeah. And 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 so you got you you got offered this off Broadway show. I'll let you talk about it a little bit in a minute, but you had to be there like in two days or something, um, which yeah. meant you know we had the entire rest of the rehearsal process for uh, for Death Trap. Although you, you you had it up on its feet and you know it kind of worked your way through uh, virtually all of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but then, so the, th the phone call, can we talk? I got to go. <laughs> Should I do this? I can't turn this down. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's like that stuff never happens. And then it always happens at, you know, the most in inopportune time. Yeah. Uh, that's Lisa and Walter from the production of Death Trap. Such a good scene. Uh, yeah, so I was in rehearsal for, for Death Trap and, you know, all of a sudden my phone, I just started getting all these phone calls and, uh, it was, um, this woman, um, Alison Frazier, who actually played Helga, the part that Lisa is in that picture right there in the production that I did at the K Playhouse. And she said, you know, uh, you know, what are you, what are you doing right now? Um, you know, I'm doing this off Broadway production of Paradise Lost, which I had known about because they did a big press release about it and there was a bunch of, um, there was three Tony nominees in it. It was kind of this thing that was happening in New York that I, that I knew about. And I had another friend that was also in it and it's the story of Adam and Eve. And uh, well, it's really the story of Lucifer and the fall of heaven and all of that stuff. And, uh, and they were doing it on 42nd street at theater row studios and they lost the actor that was playing Adam a week into rehearsal. They started the same day as death trap and I knew enough people in the production that, you know, my name was thrown out first. And then the director, I had never worked with the director before, but I had auditioned for him a couple of times and he had remembered me. So that's what I say to, you know, other actors or when we're talking about the business is, is you never know, even if you just go to one audition and you don't get cast, it doesn't mean you're not in that director's mind. You know, I think that's true for, for you because I've been, a reader for the majestic auditions, but sometimes someone will come in an audition and they're fantastic and there's just not a part for them. But then the next season, you know, because you saw them the year before and you remember, yeah, you, you remember them. And, and that's really the way it worked for me in this, in this circumstance, you know, he had seen it before I didn't get the job, but then they just offered me the part and they said, you know, can you come now? And it was the lead in this play. And it was a kind of a bigger deal production that was going to run for two months off Broadway. And, uh, there was, there is still plans for a, a tour, a tour of it to happen in the winter. You know, obviously we, everything is up in the air right now, but it was just a, a big opportunity to um, get to ask to act in New York and to do this show and to work on new material. So I had my tail between my legs and I called Danny and I said, listen, I, I kind of don't know what to do. And, um, and you couldn't have been kinder. You were so kind and, you know, you were like, you have to go do this and it's a great opportunity. And it's the biz. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the, yeah, it's the biz part of things, you know, which is a reality. Right. Right. It's, it's very much a reality, reality of what happens. You know, sometimes you're just sitting in your apartment waiting for the phone to ring. And then sometimes you know, I was so excited to be directing Death Trap and to have that opportunity. And then, you know, something else comes along and, and, you know, you kind of got to go 
where the opportunity and the work is. And, and it ended up, uh, I ended up getting new agents because of that show. I ended up uh, leaving the agents I was with before and signing with these new agents, you know, a week before we all went into quarantine. So timing wasn't so great, but it was just a, a big stepping stone for me. And, I, you know, I'm grateful that you were so kind and, and, you know, letting me do that. And, and I think the production ended up to be, you know, not to toot my own horn, but it was one of the, you know, most enjoyable plays I've seen at the Majestic in a while. And I know audiences were going crazy for it. It was selling right. like, like a musical usually sells. So I was right. so happy to hear it did, was doing so well for you all. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, 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 was, I was very happy also to, uh, to end up picking it up. Mm -hmm. you know, I had a great time working on it myself, you know. Then lots of times, uh, you know, we put together a five-play season and, you know, as often as not, I end up directing the musicals, and they're usually like first show, fifth show, right? And, and stuff like uh, Death Trap, and you know, uh, Death of a Salesman, or or what have you. You know, um, <laughs> they uh, they they fall in the middle, and and I have to like pass them off to other directors. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes I don't, you know. Uh, as much as I would like to to take those shows on, some of those shows on myself. Well, in this case, I kind of got to do that, so it was great. Thanks, Robbie. <laughs> we tag teamed because I I remember it was like it was all, all happening during Christmas and New Year's, and I came yeah. up we didn't have rehearsal on New Year's and and like went through the fight stuff a little bit more and was able to you know look at it and. Uh, and then I was able to drive up one day after one of my shows and, and see it. And, and I couldn't have been happier with the work you did. And all those actors were, you know, it was a well cast show. And when it's well cast, that's, you know, 90% of the work. So it is indeed. All right. Here's a, um, this is like a two parter, maybe a three parter. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have a, uh, a, a dream role that you, aspire to one of these days and then um what what's your process for working on a, on a role and and of course we have to ask this uh because audience members always want to know how you learn how do you learn all those damn lines uh, um you know when i think about dream roles i think about um the first thing that comes to mind is writers I love good writing. And so who's writing the stuff that it's really fun to just dig into. So playwrights that come to mind are Arthur Miller. I think there's a reason why his stuff is still being produced on Broadway every other year, being done in regional theaters across the country. You've done a great, you know, good amount of his work, all my sons and death of a salesman. Yeah. So and those those two shows specifically, you know, when I think about, oh, you know, what role would I love to dive into? Chris in All My Sons is, is such a great, such a great part. It was just on Broadway last year with Annette Benning, And and then, you know, either of those those sons in um, Death of a Salesman would be fun to to do. Um, if we're happy. Yeah. Yeah. I have. Um, See, I would cast you as happy. Yeah, I'd probably do that. You know what I want to do, though? I want to do the production where you cast two guys as the brothers and they switch roles every night. Well, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe that's my maybe that's my dream role, because there's nothing better than than good writing, you know, and then any any Tennessee Williams play. The Glass Menagerie is probably my favorite play. So. So uh, and then the the second part was the process. Process and learning lines and learning lines. Well, those are those are hand in hand. Hand because, in hand, right? Because for me, my process is learning the lines first. Because I don't feel like I can act, or you know, ninety percent of acting is reacting. I don't feel like I can react or listen to someone unless I have my lines memorized. Unless I have the script out of my hand, and I'm actually just playing with another actor in a scene in a rehearsal room. So. I like to get off book. And also when you're just getting off book, you're thinking, well, why is that next line there? Like, why is the writer choosing to put that next line? Why is he choosing this word? And you really have to start thinking about that. And that gives you clues to the state of mind the character is in, what the character wants, how the character feels about the person that they're talking to. 
So the memorization for me is huge. And I try to get off book for even auditions I have when, you know, when you have the opportunity. And then the second big thing is finding something about the character or the situation that you can bring something from your own life to. You know, maybe the character has a difficult relationship with um, with a friend or a sibling. So it's like, okay, um, you know, I don't have a sibling. I'm an only child, but like, when have I had a difficult relationship with a family member or, or a friend or, you know, a cousin or something that I can bring into that? So really bringing a lot of myself and my experiences to the character, I think is, is huge. And then just having fun. I think so many people forget that. And we forget that sometimes when we're in the rehearsal room, it's like, you know, you want to get it right. And rehearsal process is so short. And so you want to, I want to get it right so we can move on to the next thing. But you know, that's a trap. It's about exploring and having fun. And because, you know, sometimes happy accidents end up being the best choices in the things that end sure. up oh, yeah. on stage for opening night. So, yeah, yeah. Those, those happy accidents are, you kind of pray for those actually, you know? Yep. Yep. And mm -hmm. I think that can even happen, you know, on stage when you're doing the show. Oh yeah. You, know? you can't, you can't steer toward them mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and make them appear, but uh, you can kind of set an environment in which it's possible for, for the, those things to happen. We got a great, we have a great question uh, from the audience. Carly tells me about directing tips. We do. Uh, Cindy here has joined us and she asks, question for Robbie. What are a couple of the best tips a director ever gave you and how do they help you? So nice. I guess tips for, you know, your directing style or maybe you as an actor, however you want to interpret that. Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind, thanks for the question, Cindy. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is a little bit of what we just talked about. I think casting great actors. I think taking the time in the audition and in the callback to really give the actors some direction to see how they respond to the direction also talking to the actor, just, hey, where are you from? You know, how'd you hear about this audition or this play? Or, you know, tell me, how, how are you feeling today to get a sense of them as a person? Because at the end of the day, you really want to, you're going to be spending time with this person and you want to know if they're fun to work with, fun to be in the room with. And so if you really get the right people and the right DNA for a show, meaning the right group up together, then I really like to, let them see, you know, kind of get out of their way and let them find the choices and let them find the way into the character. And then, you know, gently steering them in the direction. In the beginning, it's like loose blocking and, you know, how are you feeling? And then as the weeks roll on in rehearsal and, and we get more confident, then it's getting more specific about lines and text. I'm a huge text person. You know, there, we have um, something we call text-based and that really means, you know, everything coming from the words that are on the page. So that means not inventing something like, oh, let's invent that she has a limp. You know, if it's not really there in the text, then let's then let's not go that way. You know, if there's a little clue to something that this character, you know, may actually not really like their father in the text, then let's really explore that and 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 see how far we can go with that. So. Uh, uh, how how about um, this is Cindy's still Cindy's question? Um, tips that uh, that a director has given you. Do you have anything that that stands out and comes or comes to mind? Yeah, um, you know, I was doing a production of What the Butler Saw, which is a Joe Orton play, fantastic play, um, at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. And it was a, a British farce. Um, and, you know, at one point I was, you know, when you're doing a farce and the stakes are really high and you're kind of getting zany. And he just said, you know, take all that energy that's in your hands and in your body and put it into the words, like really chew those words and make it all happen on the text. You know, um, one of the biggest differences between theater and television it's a question I get a lot. You know, what what are the differences? Theater is a is a text based language medium, so people are hearing the story through the words. They're seeing the staging, but they're really listening. And so, you know, you really want to make sure you're hitting your operatives in a sentence. You know, what's the most important word in a sentence? 
And then television is, is based on pictures. You know, you're watching pictures. So, you know, you turning your head slightly tells a story in itself without words. So I think that director that day, Paul Mullins is his name. He's a fantastic director, said, you know, really take all of them, take, take all the energy and the story that you're telling with your body and put it into the words. So I, I try to look by that and the right side. Uh, let's see. What was um, uh, what was the most challenging show that you've worked on at the Majestic? I'm guessing last five years. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, Jason Robert Brown wrote the music, and he also wrote uh, music for Bridges in Madison County, which you all, which you also did. And it's incredibly challenging. I mean, Mitch Shakur, the the wonderful music director at the at the Majestic and I were, would just work for hours on these complicated rhythms. And and it's almost like Shakespeare in that the rhythms are there for a reason because they tell a story and the notes are just so high, you know, and you're singing the whole time. So even when I'm off stage, you know, I'd be changing very quickly into the next costume and drinking water. And it was really like running a, running a marathon. It was, it was hard, but also, you know, like I said earlier, um, the most rewarding show. So uh, how does uh, working at the Majestic, being on stage at the Majestic, um, affect how you approach a role? Uh, does it have an impact on you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even just saying this. The Majestic is one of my favorite theaters to act in. And, and many actors have said this because it's a thrust. So it means that it's not... Um, a proscenium would be a more typical stage, you know, where a curtain just rises and the, the theater is back behind that curtain. So with the Majestic, these plays and these stories and these characters are really in your front lap, in your lap, you know, they are pushed into the audience. We are, it's almost like a we're inside someone's living room sometimes it feels like. And so what that means is as an actor, you can be more intimate. You can be more realistic. You don't have to worry about, projecting or being seen from you know 500 rows back you can have more realistic reactions to things what's also fun about acting and also directing you don't always have to have your actors facing front all the time because you know if you're turned toward the left side of the house you know the right side is seeing your back but the left side is seeing maybe the inner conversation that's going on in your mind and you know they're seeing a different story so you know, sometimes when friends or family members would come see shows I've done at the Majestic, they that have come multiple times, they say, "Oh, I like to sit in different spots because I feel like I get a totally different story." Yeah. And I encourage people who come to the Majestic to maybe sit in some different seats because you you get different stories, and and it's um so unique to the Majestic, and it's a great space, so it's really fun to to be in. You know, I think we, we talked about this um, a week or so ago with uh, JT and maybe with Kate as well. Um, you know, personally, I, I know that w whenever I'm directing at the Majestic, I uh, very intentionally uh, try to include the audience. You know, I think Kate described them as uh, uh, a character. Um, yeah, absolutely. And... Um, a character in the story. And so I've oftentimes, you know, like I, I do a lot of house entrances and maybe do a lot of stuff down in, down in the moat in, mm -hmm. in front of the front, you know, just to um, make the audience a part of the story that we're, we're telling, you know, sometimes just direct address and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things and like that. And the, resident scenic artist that you have, Greg, is incredible. And I think everyone watching this, you know, who's a fan of the Majestic will know that every time you walk into that theater, you never know what you're gonna see. You know, I love watching audience members, you know, and they say, oh my gosh, you know, when they get to see the set, it's just, it's totally different. And you can do so many different things with that space that are, that are so special. I mean, think about doing Miss Saigon on that stage, you know, that was an incredible, an incredible feat, but, it's, you know, you can do so much with the space that we were able to tell the story in such a cool way. And I climbed up a ladder into a helicopter. Into a helicopter. So, <laughs> hey, if you can do that, you can do anything, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the big thing about Saigon is like, you know, 
how are you going to do the helicopter? You can't possibly do the helicopter. <laughs> well, we did the helicopter. Yeah, you know, yeah. We figured it out. But it, the 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 space also has it. It is it's so very intimate, um, but it also uh, scenically it has its challenges. Mm. Um, you know how to fit that environment that's going to be a part of telling this story, you know, into that, that space, you know, and if we were to uh, take the, the very same play with the very same uh, group of actors and, and the, the, the same designers and the same production staff and, you know, move it to a 500 seat proscenium, you know, you'd be doing a different thing. You know, it'd be like a very different play. Words are the same. You know, the music might be the same if it was a musical, you know. Um, so, you know, there's the uh, fitting the fitting all of these shows into the Majestic is uh, um, an important uh, a challenge, I think, for us. And, and Greg, um, boy, bless him. He's uh, he really knows that space. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun for the designers. It's it's really fun for the actors to, to get to do that. Oh, that's from the last five years. That's um Darcy, who's another one of my most uh favorite actors that at the Majestic, and she's just such a talent. So doing that show with her was really special. Yeah, Carly, maybe we can flip through some more pictures. See what we got there. Yeah, sure. Let's see what we have here. One second. Oh, we have another gem of young Robbie, if you would like to see that one. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's so sweet. Lost in numbers. Sandra Blaney and, and Steve Pettit, who is the production stage manager of the Majestic now, and I'm so proud of him. And he is just doing such good work at the Majestic, and I'm love that we still get to work together even when we were kids and we get to now and he's doing such great things with the children's theater and you know i'm very proud to be an original company member of the children's theater because of the great work he's still doing um oh and sandra i mean that show changed my life that was the cool that was the coolest thing really special i remember one day sandra <laughs> forgot an entrance and uh we were like, Steve and I were just like sitting in the bed and we like just didn't know what to do. And so we just started having like an impromptu pillow fight and the audience was laughing and they were into it. And then Sandra comes running out and, you know, just really fun things. I remember that. That's a great. That's now a great that you brought it up. I do remember that. Yeah. Sorry for throwing you under the bus, Sandra, but. <laughs> um, yeah. What else we got? Oh, the, the last five years. Yeah. Very difficult song with lots and lots of words. I think a lot of people were like, what was that song about? But it's uh it was really, really fun. And who doesn't love celebrating Christmas in May? I think that's when that show was. <laughs> what else we got there, Carly? Well, it seems like a lot of the collection that we have was from last five years, but I know myself as a technician, what I'm dying to know is, do you have any good backstage bloopers that you want to share with us? Speaking of backstage bloopers, <laughs> oh, speaking probably of. the biggest one I've ever had was at the Majestic. It was during Over the Tavern. So... It was, a, it was a house set and I, my character, I was the older brother and I was supposed to run in the door, you know, grab some cereal and then run up the stairs and eat it and walk into my brother's room, who was played by Dan Robert, and tell him about this, this dumpster that I drew a picture of this naked girl on the dumpster, right? And, um, but what I did was I opened the door and these doors are real doors and I opened it straight into my forehead and my eyebrow, and I think everyone watching can see that scar right there, into my eyebrow. I'm, I'm like, oh man, that hurt. And I'm just running across the stage, like nothing nothing really happened. And I get to the top of the stairs, you know, and go into his bedroom. And Dan, you know, is just staring at me, like going white. And all of a sudden, like, I just feel blood rushing down my face. 
my contacts turn yellow. Um, I was like doing the whole scene and like covered in blood and then like didn't know what to do. And then I run backstage and, you know, Melissa was back there and got me all cleaned up. And funny enough, in the next scene, I come in and I have a black eye and bandages because someone beat me up because I drew that, you know, picture. So I actually had some authentic battle wounds, but, um, and, and my parents picked me up from the theater that night and I went to the emergency room and I got 12 stitches in my eyebrow. Uh, but oh the, show, the show must go on. And, you know, there was, Barbara McCune was there that night and she was like, I thought you popped a blood packet. I thought it was supposed to happen. I was like, <laughs> yeah, that would have been a good blood packet. Talk about oh death trap blood. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I guess as long as I'm still here, I have another question from the audience. Um, Lee Chambers is here with us today. And she asked, Robbie, can you talk about how it was being a young actor working with adult established actors? How did they help you? Were they open and sharing their craft with you? Oh yeah. I mean, it, that was, you know, very few people when they're in high school or, you know, 16 or 15, you know, all through high school get to get to spend so much time working with professional actors. I mean, I think, you know, you just happened to program seasons when I was in high school that just always required a high school aged guy. And, and so I was lucky enough to, to be year after year, have some great roles with great, great actors. I feel like I could name a whole, a whole slew of them. Steve Henderson, John Hagg, who was just on here, um, JT, you know, they're all incredible people. And what I love to do is just watch. Like even today when I'm doing a show with anyone that I just think, you know, they're, they're good or, or I'm, I'm admiring them. I just love to watch and see what they're doing, how they're rehearsing, how they're interacting with the director. How are they talking to the director? Are they defensive? Are they inquisitive? What kind of questions are they asking? I think, I think the behavior is huge for me, like how, how people handle situations, how they handle stressful situations. You know, I certainly remember during Miss Saigon, I think we spent the whole first day teching and we teched, you know, the first two minutes of the show. And it was a stressful situation, but it was, you know, encouraging to look around and see, you know, Ben Ashley was like as calm as a cucumber and just, you know, there making jokes, making sure everyone was doing okay. And he was the lead of the show. And so, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you know, again, behavior, just being a good person is, it is really great to see because then when you're the lead, you know, when you're leading a company, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy who's not stressing out, who's not complaining, who's trying to make the, you know, the best, the best of it. Um, and there were some good role models that were around in those years that I was, that I was learning from and some incredibly talented actors, you know, like I said before, David Bolin, Sandra Blaney, um, you know, they're, they're all incredible. Um, Kate, all of them are were just incredible and, and very welcoming, and um, and it was it's an it's just something that not a lot of kids my age got to have. And so then when I went to college, you know, I kind of already felt like I was a, a little bit ahead because I just knew more about the business and and loved it, you know, more. So it's the, probably the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing still. I know it is. The uh, let's see, I had a question for you and I think I've forgotten it, but I'll move on to this one. Yeah, I know that um, you have your own podcast that you're doing from uh, will you move to New York? Will you go back to New York and do it from there, or are you continuing to do it down at the Cape? Um, well, the great thing about podcasting is you can do it from anywhere. Sure. And, uh, I started it two years ago, it's called The Breakdown with Robbie. And it is about, uh, there's the logo right there. Um, it's, I interview top casting directors, agents, managers, directors, artistic directors, you know, all the people that are in the business kind of um, on the other side of things. Because I think a lot of colleges and a lot of undergraduate programs and graduate programs for that matter, you know, don't really focus on the business aspect of it when people graduate. When you graduate as an actor, you're an entrepreneur, you're running your own business. And I think that a lot of 
auditioning, how you get an agent. If you don't have an agent, how do you get into the audition? How do you network? What are what are uh, sincere, honest ways to network and meet people? And and how often do you communicate with your representation? Or you know, if you have a, a director that you like, how do you keep in touch with them? You know, and it's not just for actors in New York. It's for actors all over the country. It's for people that are in high school, maybe thinking about making this a career and wanting to know a little bit more about how it works. People that are in college decide, you know, about to graduate and maybe want to know more about the business because their program didn't teach them or for parents, you know, that are like, I don't know, you know, the business that my kid is going out into. And so the podcast was born and I launched it uh, a couple months ago and episode 10 is about to be released. And I'm excited because episode 10 is going to be with Tony nominee Hunter Foster, who was nominated for the little shop of horrors on Broadway. He did you're in town uh, on Broadway and now is the artistic director of red house art center up in Syracuse, New York, and is a director, a huge director all over the country. So I've gotten some really, really exciting people and I'm hoping to continue with a lot of exciting people. So you can find it on, you know, wherever you find podcasts on um, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Google Play. Um, and, and take a listen because even if it's, you know, even if it's not really up your alley, I think if you're a theater lover, you might be interested to know about, you know, the behind the scenes and the business of, of, how this all works and you know how some of your favorite actors get to where they are and and even if you're auditioning for you know your community theater or you're auditioning for the majestic you know it's there's a lot of directors talking about what they're looking for in auditions helpful hints ways to communicate in the room how to execute a callback you know helpful hints for for everyone and it's been a you know my saving grace to be to be busy during this you know quarantine time and and to be helping others, so it's been really fun. So, uh, so Robbie, uh, people just need to what go and key in the breakdown with Robbie Simpson, and yep. So if you just Google that, you'll find it. But the website is thebreakdownpodcast.com, breakdownpodcast.com, and then on Instagram and Facebook at uh, at the breakdown with Robbie. So yeah. it's super easy to find, and there's a new episode every Monday, and. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Well, that's really, really, I think, uh, 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 a valuable service. I agree with you, Robbie. Um, you know, students are coming out of uh, undergrad programs in theater and even graduate programs in theater, and uh, they have, I think, no clue about theater in the real world. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. And, and you know, I think that the theater is – a you know, it's almost, it's ritualistic. You know, some people compare theater to it being re a religious experience for them. It's, you know, we go to the theater, we congregate, we hear stories. We've been doing it like that, you know, for thousands of years, back to Grecian times. And and so much of the business is kind of, um, well, we've always done it this way. So this is how we always have to do it. And so much of it is shrouded in secrecy and being ritualistic. And so, you know, part of me is just trying to like demystify it and be like, it's actually not as scary and complicated as you may, as you may make it out to be, you know, the people behind the table, when you go in and audition in, and audition, they're on your side, they want you to do well. And I think the more you hear that, um, the easier it is. And, and the more, the more you can just kind of let, let loose and be free in the room. I think it's also interesting that a lot of these agents and casting directors and directors and artistic directors started as actors. And then they slowly found their path to where they belong in the business. And that's what I'm also hoping for listeners is, you know, if you're starting as an actor, if you're starting as something, you can say, hey, I actually feel like I might be a choreographer, I might be a stage manager, or, you know, I might have another interest. And that's okay, because the people you're listening to on the podcast did the same thing and now they're at the top of their game. So I think yeah, it's yeah. a to a lot of people. Were, were, were we not going through this pandemic and, and you had a season down at the Cape, were you scheduled to direct the show there or were you going to be in the show? You know, so much of it was, uh, was in 
was in, uh, we were trying to figure it out. We, we were trying to figure like all that out. Casting was up in the air. I wasn't directing a show. A lot of the shows came with directors. You know, they were sure. hit by a certain person or, you know, this person did it on Broadway, so they're coming to do it. And, um, but we were in the middle of kind of organizing all of that when, when this all, when this all happened. But, um, but for anyone who's watching this, uh, come check out the Cape Playhouse. It's in Dennis, Massachusetts. It's where I am now. I'm in Dennis, Massachusetts. I'm the assistant artistic director. So I also do a lot of artistic administration and, and love that. And we're hoping to do a series of concerts and um, interviews and readings this summer on the Cape Playhouse lawn. And uh, so if you're in Cape Cod, um, check out the website and, and all of that because it's we're trying to bring the community together and provide content in a safe, socially distanced way and you know, um, keep moving towards summer 2021. The whole season we had planned, you know, we're doing something that similar to what you're doing, what you just announced for your plans, you yeah. know, we're picking up that seven show season and we are moving it to next summer because so many people were so excited about it and you know. It's sad. So many designers, people don't realize, you know, designers had their drafts in of their, you know, the costumers had their, they were building costumes, you know, so much is happens before that first day of rehearsal that when everything ground to a halt, it's just, um, it's sad. So we wanted to honor that by, you know, moving the whole season to 2021 and letting all of, all of those shows and designs, you know, be seen. So, yeah, yeah. I did, uh, before we wrap up, I do want to, this has come up a, a number of times about a tech rehearsal. You know, mm -hmm. so for you folks who are who are watching, you know, that's um, a, a 10 out of a 12 hour rehearsal, typically on a Sunday um, at the Majestic. And it's when we kind of, the, the set has been built and the costumes have been built and, uh, you know, all of that's in place, um, but it's when we integrate all the the sound effects, we integrate the the musicians, if it's a musical, uh, all the lighting cues, and we establish the cues and the sound cues and the entrance, whatever, what needs to be done for entrances and exits and all those kinds of things. It's an incredibly long uh, and, and oftentimes a really trying day, but then, you know, you get Monday off and then uh, you come back Tuesday and you have kind of a tech dress rehearsal and, you know, Wednesday you have an audience. So, mm -hmm. but that's the tech rehearsal, 10 out of 12. It's kind of an incredible process. I, I was doing uh, great expectations up at Syracuse stage a few years ago and my dad was in town visiting and, you know, I couldn't spend a lot of time with him because I was, you know, at the theater all day doing the tech rehearsal and, and I said, you know, why don't you come in and just sit in the back of the theater? And it's a really big theater. And I said, you know, no one will notice you. And so he just sat in the back and I said, you know, sit there for like 20, 30 minutes and you can just watch what it's, you know, what it's like. And this was a show that had a big turntable on the floor and massive flying scenery. And my dad, he said, I sat there for a few hours and just watched, you know, how much goes into it. It's costumes, it's lights, it's, you know. Into integrating all of those things, you know. And he said, he said something really enlightening to me. You know, he said, that was the moment where I realized just how hard your job is and how hard everyone in the theater works to make that visual art form. You know, you don't just throw up some lights and hope for the best. It's, it's a process and, and we all are trying to work at the highest level of our ability. And, and that's really when it all comes together. So, you know, at, at the Cape Playhouse, we have a thing where, you know, a certain level of donor membership, they, they get to come in and watch the tech rehearsals. It's a bird clock. They get to watch the tech rehearsals and it's like their favorite thing. A lot of people get to that level of membership to to be able to walk, uh, come in and watch the tech rehearsals. And so if, if anyone's watching this and they, you know, have been interested in it, maybe at some point the Majestic will let some that's people- a, that, You know, that's a really interesting idea because, you know, I have, Oh, long, long, long maintained that, you know, our audiences are in there for basically two and a half hours, right? Mm -hmm. um, and have really not a clue, you know, um, the everything that's gone into uh, and all the hours that have gone into giving 
than those two and a half hours. Yes. Um, so, you know, having, uh, inviting them in for a tech rehearsal to, you know, give them, a, I think, a, some sense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great idea. They could just sit quietly up in the balcony and, and just watch. I think people, I think people really like it. And it's, uh, it's really fun to see how a show comes together because it's so much more goes into it than, than you may think. Yeah, right, right. Robbie, my friend, thank you. Oh, Danny, this was so much fun. Just great to hang out with you and catch up. It absolutely is. Hey, and so you folks who are watching, um, what do I want to say here? You know, next week, Rand, my buddy Rand Forrester uh, will be with us. The recording of this issue uh, of, uh, of Behind the Curtain um, will be available on our YouTube channel and uh, and on our website. So you can go to majestictheater.com and, you know, track that down. Um, I would also say, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, um, I'm doing a playwriting workshop. We're going to kick that off in, in a couple of weeks. And if anybody's interested, uh, you know, if you ever thought about trying to throw your hat at trying to write a play, uh, you might be interested in this. Uh, go to our website once again, and there's some more information there. Otherwise, thanks again, Robbie, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll Thank see you, you next week. <laughs>